Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you all for coming um, on this slightly balmy uh, Friday afternoon um, for the last of this summer's Digital Classes London seminars, um, at which I'm extremely happy to um, be introducing three speakers. Um, never say we don't give you value for money. Um, we have uh, Agnes Thomas, Francesco Mambrini, and Matteo Romanello, all from the DIE. Um, in Germany, uh, and yes, based in um, uh, Cologne, and the other two in Berlin. Um, and they're going to be talking about um, the Hellespont project and talking about insights um, in the world of Thucydides. And I will let the <coughs> coming up first explain everything that that's about. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm very happy about the chance to speak here at the Digital Classicist Seminar. I think it's a great chance to present what we did within the last two or three years with the Hellespont project. And um, I will do the first part. The Hellespont project officially ran from October 2010 until this year, September 2013. Uh, we got funding from the DFG, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, NEH. It is uh, officially a cooperating project between the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin and the Perseus project at Tufts University in Medford, USA. Yeah, the Hedges One project has two big parts. We are going to present one part, um, the so-called uh, GAPGIS interface, as you will see later. The other part I just want to mention uh, shortly uh, is about to integrate several databases, object databases, um, ma uh, namely the Arachne database in Cologne, again cooperation with the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin, and the uh, um, object database of the Persis project is a few, uh, a, li a little one, also integrated in the Persis project. And this integration of the data is based on the use of the metadata uh, standard CDOC CRM. Um, the backend for this, the triple store TDB, triple store is uh, built up right now. And the first um, results for the front end we are expecting for the next week. I think until September it will be visible, something also online. So if you want to follow us, you will see also this part of the data. And it's not only the object databases we uh, are going to present there, but also parts of the case study on Thucydides. We are following also the other part with GetList and also part of uh, Matteo's work extracting uh, secondary literature from JSTOR and others. So just shortly to show that it's uh, within the two to three years, it's um, mainly three institutions that uh, we're cooperating. And of course, as it's always the case of uh, projects like that, uh, it's many persons uh, who contribu contributed in one or in the other way. Um, we won't go to present all, but just three of us, and we will try to, to keep it in time. <coughs> yeah, uh, the GAPVIS interface, um, our main part of the talk today, um, is going to integrate, based on a case study on the ancient author Thucydides of the fifth century BC, um, as well as named entities, further linguistic information, as you will see later, uh, event annotation uh, in the text, and bibliography. And they are all going to be presented within one single interface as a dynamic uh, digital uh, research environment. Uh, the case study we chose is uh, in the first book, chapters 89 to 118, the so-called Pentecontae Etia. So it is um, the period of 50 years, more or less 50 years between 480 and 430 BC. It is good to take this part as a case study because it is also limited in time and space and also <laughs> the historical events are very, very dense in this text. And since we have an event-based approach to bring all data together. It was very interesting to work with this text. Um, annotation is on um, multifold um, levels, such as um, 
as I said before, the named entities like persons, places, also organizations, um, using um, the text encoding, uh, text encoding initi initiative uh, standard, TEI. Um, then for the event annotation, manual event annotation, we have two parts. Uh, this is uh, again um, CDO, uh, based on the CDOC CRM. Um, then Francesco did a big part of the work um, with linguistic annotation, tree banking, and other. Um, and finally, why we have this gap, this <laughs> also is a name, it's an abbreviation for the Google Ancient Places Visualization. It's, um, we, we got the code from this project in order to develop our own interface. We added several future, uh, features that we need in addition for Hellespont. And the original gap is you can see at this link. Yeah, why we call it Hellespont, uh, just shortly, as you can imagine, probably it's um, the place where uh, it's, it's the easiest place uh, of the ancient Hellespont where you could bridge in a very small part of the sea. Uh, Asia and Europe together, and this is a symbol what, that we are going to bridge archaeology and philology together uh, based on this case study of Thucydides. And hopefully, with any following project, we can also find some optimized um, approaches to um, get into this um, also many, maybe bigger parts of the evidence. Yeah, let's start maybe, I, I will just give an introduction to GAPVIS before we have a look then to the data behind, um, presented by Francesco and Matteo. Um, what do we want to provide with GAPVIS for HealthSpond? We want to connect several uh, different uh, information in a consistent way so that uh, the user can um, browse the interface and find maybe, depending on their interest, um, different information. So uh, we start normally with the book summary view. This is taken from get this, from the other get this. As you see, no, I took a screenshot, it's not too good quality, but the main thing I hope you can see is that um, we have a list of the top entities taken from the Pentacon idea. The several colors show um, different kinds of names. So the red ones, for example, are the persons, the ancient persons. The blue ones are the organizations like Athenians. So we link to Athens as topography. Um, then we have um, natural places like uh, landscapes also in green color like the Peloponnese and what is left we have a green color for um, mandled places like cities or um, walls or similar things. Um, from this entity list I showed you um, one can choose then one, one single name that is maybe interesting for the user. It's one um, kind to start to browse the interface I'm presenting right now. For example, <laughs> um, we see the entity detail view now for one named entity, the so-called uh, long walls built from the Athenians in the Pentecost idea from Athens to um, the harbor Piraeus. Um, you see that the entries are done in a German database, this is Arachne, where we link to, so the so-called Lange Mauern. And what is interesting here is, um, from the one hand, that we provide several URIs to other projects where this name is um, somehow uh, known or it is um, provided with further information. So we don't do things always from the beginning, but we also take um, parts from other projects. Of course, we want to really connect information uh, in the internet uh, in a scientific way. And what is interesting is um, the related places you can see from the map. So the long walls are placed in Attica, of course, and they are connected with several places in Attica due to the Athenian politics. But the 
strongest connection following the narration of uh, Thucydides is the connection to Sparta. And this is the case because there was a big political problem for these wars as described by Thucydides. And this discussion is much more important in the text than uh, the building itself. So this you can see from this thicker line. <coughs> From the entity detail view, you can get this. As I mentioned before, we have several links. One is again uh, to the entry in Arachne, to the entity in Arachne, which I show here. So you see an archaeological description. Here it's uh, not too much left in this case, but again, we have an archaeological description. We have the ancient sources, we have part kind of um, description of the history, and of course, we have scientific literature that is not anyone in the screenshot, but all these information are in Arachne. And in many cases, we have also uh, images, pictures, it depends a bit of uh, license things and so on. But in general, there are many. Um, from the entity detail view, again, you can always switch to the connected places. Um, before, we have seen the long walls. Now we see Athens as topography, as a center in the map. And here you have the entity details about Athens. And with this, you can play along as <laughs> slowly you wish. Um, the next um, step to browser interface would maybe be to see the text itself. We have it in ancient Greek. We all annotate it in ancient Greek. We will provide also a translation taken from Perseus, as well as the Greek uh, version of the text is taken from Perseus um, and annotated, um, as you can see here from the highlighting in TI, the named entities. And um, following the example of the long walls, we now see that this is here highlighted in the text and you can see what is the author saying about the long walls. Instead, uh, in this case, he says, this means that uh, the Athenians then uh, finished their long walls after many, many, many other events. Um, below you can see like an inner timeline following again the narration of the author um, with the chapters below, um, the entity, entities list for each uh, chapter and you can run it and follow and it's all links you can click on it and see the details. Yeah, from the, um, this reading view, of course you can then go to the next chapter, uh, but you have also here um, the possibility to change between several views, again, within this reading view. So it's not only the time map we see here, but also, and this is already part of the event annotation I mentioned before, uh, we have the event list connected to the text each time, so it's always the text of one chapter again, and uh, beside a so-called event list. And we have both lists at the moment together, um, so we can a bit compare what is go going on here. So one approach is seen here, the other here. On the left is uh, the manual event annotation. And the main idea is to go through the secondary literature. In this case, it's a comment of um, commentary of Hornblower on Thucydides uh, on the chapter 108, we have seen before. Uh, Hornblower mentions with his titles, he has four parts uh, of the Pentecontinent here. One time it's one chapter, one time it's part of a chapter, one time it's many chapters. <laughs> Uh, for, this, for a single event. However, he finds um, an event, he finds out an event list, or you can, you can imagine how the events take place one after the other if you go through Hornblower. And this I did and got this list for the uh, chapter 108 in the first book. Um, and for example, I always took the, Horn, uh, the Hornblower's title, so it's the first is Tanaga campaign and Battle of Oinophyta. The next is part of the first Tanaga campaign. The third, again, part of the first Battle of Oinophyta. And what we plan um, 
If you then scroll, if, if you then go along with the mouse to have also the highlighting on the left side, in the text it's not yet implemented, um, then we have as a next event completion of the walls, the next is coercion by Athens of Aegina, and the last is the Periplus of Ptolemides. So in the gap with view, let's again hear the list we had right now, and the text of the chapter. On the right hand, <coughs> you see um, the linguistic approach for the events that Francesco did. Um, and we see this list is much longer. So it is until here, maybe, for the same chapter, because, of course, um, linguistic annotation is much more fine-grained than what we are doing normally in history. <coughs> The last thing is to show that from each um, title of an event, of both kinds of events, we then have a detailed view. Right now it's still a workbench for the events with uh, several um, information, like how, one, how the events are related uh, between themselves, or also places and actors involved um, a dating provided by the author, in this, in this case Hornblower, and so on. And this we did for both, and so we see also the connection. If you remember the entity detail view, the long walls related to Phalaron, but also to Sparta, but also to Phokis, and other places, Mega, Vafibrose, Interface, you will see all these places together. It gets obvious if you see then the events, because in the same chapter as mentioned, the Battle of Anorphita, and with Francesco's annotation, we also learned that it was Mironides who was the general, um, not in this event, but uh, helped me a bit in the other. Um, he was general against uh, the ocean. So this is from my part, now uh, Francesco with the linguistic annotation. All right, thank you. Uh, so one of uh, our problems, I guess, as presented, uh, was how do we represent the uh, historical content in the, the text of the city? Just one way, as Agnes has said, is we go through the scholarly literature, the historical uh, commentaries on the text of the cities, and we see uh, what is established in the scholarship. And uh, this part of the city this is related to this ba particular battle, or this debate, or this historical event. We wanted to try also to implement a more ambitious uh, approach, uh, data-driven or uh, bottom-up approach, and let the text, so to say, speak uh, for itself, and see if by looking at the linguistic structure of the text, we can somehow uh, retrieve information on, uh, on the content. Uh, as you may imagine, it's a, a very uh, ambitious project because uh, Whenever we try, we read a chunk of text and we try to figure out what, is, uh, what, what this text is about. Even if we don't understand that, we perform a lot of interpretation. There are a lot uh, going on behind that. Uh, what? Let's try to figure that out with, uh, with one example. Uh, we take a, if we take a sentence, uh, even randomly, from the text of the city, this from our case study, uh, we first problem that we meet is, of course, the fact that the, this sentence is a part of a long narr narrative, and the author, of course, does not bother to uh, mention explicitly the actors that are involved in the text, but it will use some linguistic pointers to, to something that he said before. Like in this example, uh, he would say, for example, they invited them especially because they considered them particularly skilled in siege operation and so on. But how? Can we understand who these they are? Uh, of course, we can do that if we take the contents, the, the context into account. So we see that at the beginning of the chapter, Thucydides said, "The siege of Ithome uh, proved tedious, and so the Spartans called the Athenians." And then we can pretty much figure out that this they and this them are, are the uh, Spartans and the Athenians. Not quite to tell you the truth. This sentence, for example, is uh, debated uh, between historians because you can uh, interpret this this last part, especially either it works either if you take this uh, last day as the Spartans or the Athenians, and so it is not entirely clear, not even to human readers, uh, who these they are. Uh, and of course, you can see from bracket square 
uh, the, the brackets, the square bracket, that uh, Greek, uh, uh, the Greek language doesn't even need a pronoun over there because whenever a subject, as you know, uh, whenever a subject uh, is uh, taken uh, over from the previous sentence, Greek can also omit the uh, subject pronoun. Uh, but then, if we want to uh, infer historical events from this part, maybe we would like to leave that last part out because it's not even something that happened, it's something that might have happened, that might have happened in, the, in a possible world that is not our own. So they would have taken the place by force, maybe we would like to filter that out. And maybe even, if we want to be sophisticated, we can also see that this is actually the same verb in Greek, even if you don't see that. This is not two things. The, uh, the Spartans did not uh, call the Athenians twice, but to see this say, okay, they called the, 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 the Spartans called the Athenians, and they called the Athenians because of this and this other matter. So it's not two events, but it's the same event uh, narrated twice, this, if we want to be very sophisticated. I have already mentioned uh, a few linguistic operations that are uh, sophisticated. Uh, this is pretty much a um, representation, a diagram of those operations that we would like to do in order to get uh, this content. We, of course, need to go to a fine uh, grained level of analysis and uh, down from sentence down to the very words of the text. We want to have information on the part of speech of each word, distinguish noun, verbs, etc. We would like to see a representation of the syntax of the sentence, but not only the syntax, because it is one thing of being the syntactic subject of the verb uh, I beat somebody, it's another thing of being the syntactic subject of the verb I am beaten by somebody else. So we would like to also have information on semantics, if somebody is a patient or an actor. Of, uh, so this is what in linguistic is called semantic uh, labeling or labeling of semantic roles. We want to perform this part that's very important, co-reference resolution. Who are the they mentioned in the text? The Athenians, the Spartans, and so on. So what is pronoun, what the pointer, linguistic pointer, point to? Maybe we would like, as in the last uh, case, distinguish between the given information and the new information, so get a glimpse of the information structure of the text. And most important, we don't want to do that on the English, some modern English translation, because we can have all these, uh, we can buy all these uh, software to do this kind of stuff, mostly for free uh, and with good accuracy. But we, if we are working on English, but we want to do that on the Greek original. How do we do with Greek? Not so well, as you can see. We can chunk a text down to the very detailed level uh, with uh, good accuracy and fully automatically. The syntactic and morphological analysis we cannot do with state-of-the-art uh, art accuracy automatically, but at least we have some standards for, uh, to encode this kind of analysis and data. Annotated data we can use as training sets for our tools. We don't even have that for the more semantic, uh, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, operations like word sense disambiguation, co-reference resolution, semantic role, or even, we don't even have standards. To, to do that, so we have pretty much to invent everything. But we have some, some uh, resources we can start from. Uh, this is the ancient Greek dependency tree bank that was started from the, by the Persis project in 2009, and it's uh, 350,000 more or less uh, word annotated corpus with annotation uh, of ancient Greek texts, classical uh, and archaic age with annotation on uh, part of speech, lemma, and syntactic relation. And uh, this is pretty much a representation of a sentence in form of a tree, that's the name of course, tree bank, uh, of the syntactic relations between the, the different, uh, different words uh, in the text. But then again, the analysis that is done uh, in, in the following, the, schema of the ancient Greek dependency tree bank is word by word in the text, but no uh, co-reference resolution, no integration of missing subjects, or no information structure, and so on. But it's a start, at least. So what I, the, the task, the ambitious task that I mentioned before, I see it right now as we take, we build from what we have, and we add what we miss, the semantic information especially. 
What kind of semantic information? One in particular that's very relevant for us would be what in, in linguistic jargon is called valency. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, there's no better definition of valency, which is a rather complex uh, concept, than the one that was given by one of the pioneers of this uh, kind of analysis, Lucien Tenier. Uh, it's, uh, uh, that makes it pretty easy to understand. It's a, this little drama that is behind the word that we, that whenever we end up some concept. If I say go, verb to go, you immediately understand that in order to make a sentence out of it, I need somebody that goes and a place this somebody goes to. Then I can add whatever circumstances I want, time, place, uh, I, can go, uh, I can go quickly or uh, slowly, but there is some difference in the information that I can put in this, uh, in this sentence. I need some core actors, pretty much like in chemistry, I would need to fill the spots that are uh, there in the elements, and then I can add some other, uh, some other information. But those uh, core arguments are always there, even in a communication, even if they are implied by the, content, but by the context. So if I don't mention in Greek, like it is absolutely possible in Greek, I don't mention the subject, it is because it is retrievable from what I said before, so it is there. It's not expressed, but it is there. And luckily, we have a model of annotation, of linguistic annotation, that's where valency plays a big role, and it's still compatible with the kind of uh, three bank analysis that I mentioned before that we already have in Greek, and it actually was the model of the ancient Greek dependency three bank, that comes from uh, the Prague dependency three bank uh, for the description of the Czech uh, language, where the sentence is still represented as a dependency tree, pretty much as it was before, as it is in the ancient Greek dependency tree bank, but some other information is added on top. Uh, what kind of information? Valency, for example. Valency arguments that are missing. You can see probably that it's, uh, this node is different, uh, graphically represented as a square node, differently from the other words. Uh, because this subject is not there, it's not expressed in the sentence, but it's part of the valency of the verb. And so we put the subject that is, the node that is missing, the, the argument that is missing there. We say that it's just a, a stub for something that it's not there, but it's referred, co-reference resolution, to what this uh, linguistically, this piece of information refers to. So if the sentence means uh, it was in this way that the Athenians came to the situation in which they, but the they is missing in Greek, prospered, subject of the, the prospered is they that we put in English, is this note back to the, refers back to the Athenians. So we perform some of the tasks that we wanted for the, uh, before. Information structure. These are is the new the, the notes that are in yellow are the new uh, part. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but we can we can work with uh, with this uh, uh, for now. It's the new information. The white notes are the given uh, information. So we distinguish what we wanted before, and of course we still and also this is not an in, uh, alternative tree from the syntactic tree that we had before. It's uh, something that integrated and interplay with the syntactic representation that we had before. And so we can always retrieve information on part of speech, models, and, uh, and all the kind of linguistic information that we wanted for our task. And so if we take these little dramas, this uh, balance, these words that uh, not only uh, verbs, but even nouns can have valency, even adjectives can have valency. If we take this little drama and we turn it into likely candidates for being historical events, like battle, for example, battle between two sides, uh, this would have a valency frame, and this would be a pretty good candidate for historical content. We turn them into a representation of something like events, and then we can fill out some, we can extract from the, this kind of relation, the relation between words, the hierarchical relation between words, some of our conceptual uh, uh, relations that we work with in our representation of the events. In this case, for example, Thucydides explicitly says that one uh, event is motivated by another, is caused by another, so we can draw this relation. One is the cause of the other. 
very quickly. There are some cool things that we can do, apart from that event instruction, that we can do with all this information that is there. Agnes mentioned the long wall of Athens and the relations between uh, other places. Uh, I was struck when I saw this picture by this relation between, uh, between the long walls of Athens and Phokis, and I asked myself, why is that? You can see why it's that. It's co-occurrence. It's because the fact that in one passage of Thucydides, the Athenians brought the territories of Boeotia and Phokis under their obedience, so on and on and on and on, and also at the same time, long, they, they finished the building of the long walls at home. Interesting, very interesting. I'm interested to know that these are mentioned in the same sentence and pretty much the same chapter, but I would like this kind of relations to be a little more detailed semantically. So, for example, uh, a little bit more, uh, um, yeah, a little more interesting than this. So, for example, I would like to know if the Athenians traveled to a place uh, rather than simply be mentioned uh, in the same sentence as another place that could have nothing to do with them. Is this possible? Yes, entirely possible. Because uh, let's take one example a verb like uh, to say, for example. In its valency frame, a verb like this has actors and directions, places where people sail to. It suffice then to ask, where do the, Athens, the, the Athenians sail, for example? What other named entities are in uh, part of this frame? Let's bring them together. Unfortunately, I don't have any fancy map like this to show you the results of this kind of uh, analysis. We are working on implement uh, this kind of relations. Or, for example, fight. It would be nice to see projected on the map the different uh, conflictual relations between the, uh, between the um, actors in the world of two cities. Very last thing, we have long list of uh, uh, verbs where uh, the Athenians or the Spartans are the actors perform something and not only, not quite only the places where Thucydides says the Athenians did that but also the place where Thucydides says they, meaning the Athenians, did that or also places where he says did that, meaning the Athenians we can bring all this together and by the Valency lexicon, it's quite a long story but uh, we'll cut it short uh, we can collect all these places and see what do the Athenians do in the Pentagon idea. You see that as a word cloud. And I think it's very cool if you compare what the Athenians do in the Pentagon idea of the city this. Look at the military vocabulary with what the Spartans do in the Pentagon idea. Pretty, this is a pretty good representation of what the city that says. The Athenians build their own power and uh, conquer the whole Greek world while the Spartans basically did didn't do anything. Didn't react unless it was too late. Go in and call in somebody as a helper or send in forth some as a reactions to what the Athenians were doing before. Or they, uh, they were scared by what the Athenians did. Or sent ambassadors because at the political level, not quite at the military level, where look at what the Athenians did. So this is, uh, again, this is very not very sophisticated, I didn't go through all these details so I, I couldn't be entirely sure, but it's a, anyway a pretty picture, I think, to end up my, my part as well. Yeah, and the last change of speaker, uh, and the last also dimension that we tried to add to the literature environment of gap fields. And the last uh, dimension is the literature and the related literature to to explain the project here. Um, so what, what you can see here is a view where you can browse the bibliography related to um, secondary sources that are relevant for the particular tier. So we're not talking about all secondary sources, it's a selection. So journal articles accepted from JSTOR. Um, what you can see here looks like a normal bibliography. So you have uh, the passage which is being read and then some papers uh, that are relevant to the to the text. The main difference between this kind of bibliography and the, normal, the standard bibliography is how it's constructed. So this is constructed um, automatically by extracting from the full text of the journal papers um, the passages that are cited. So whenever to hear the particular idea is cited in one of these journal articles, then it's appearing in this list. 
So it's quite comparable to what Francesco just described. It's not a top-down approach where there is a bibliography selected by someone with some bias saying these are relevant uh, readings for the Pentecontent year, but it's created bottom-up, where you start from the data, whenever that text passage is cited, then it will appear on the list. Um, and briefly about the links, there is a link to the full text in JSTOR with the caveat that it's behind a paywall. Uh, and then there is a link to the full text in Perseus, where you can read the text together with um, some nice, interesting uh, linguistic tools. Uh, so, looking at JSO, it's interesting and also challenging. It's uh, really a huge, huge corpus, um, and means and, and mining citations from it also means doing some some choices and some sampling, particularly in a project like ours with limited funding, time available, resources, and so on. Uh, so, in theory, we could have mined citations from all the journal papers classified as belonging to classics in JSTOR. There are 170,000. Uh, this, this was not feasible for the scale of the data with the resources we had. Um, so we tried to at least to select a meaningful subset of this data. And we did this by using a curated bibli bibliography that we did, that someone did in 2009, Agnes and another colleague, um, which is actually accessible in site you like um, online. So it was the top, the top down approach done by scholars um, sifting through JSTOR and selecting articles that are relevant for the 20th year. Um, and there are some 340 articles in this bibliography. So we took only the journals to which the papers belong and we used them as seeds to get from JSTOR all the articles belonging to these journals. So amplifying what was already in the bibliography but at the same time narrowing down the number of texts we were looking at. That was quite useful uh, for the resources that were needed. Um, so we ended up with some 70,000 articles, which is slightly better and more manageable. So there are some pros and cons uh, working with JSO, and I must say that um, it's a comprehensive coverage in terms of time, uh, space, language of journal articles related to classics. Uh, I a bit exaggerated, it's not more than two centuries, but pretty much two centuries of classical scholarship. Uh, the main drawback is a license. It's not openly licensed, so all the work that I have been doing on this cannot be shared freely for other people to reuse it. So all the training data for the software, all the annotations, all what we can share has to be negotiated with JSTOR. Um, so let's look now at what how the citations are extracted. So the, the main problem of extracting them is uh, broken into smaller pieces. Um, so the first part is really about extracting the components of citations. And we, I identified four components. Uh, the mention of an author, the mention of a work, or its, or its title, um, and then the scope of the reference, so the specific text passage which is being referred to. Um, and then there is another one, but it's, it's a hybrid, and I don't want to, to go into that. So the first step is really about extracting these components from the text, nothing else. There is no semantics about what actually each stream means. Um, then the second part is figuring out the relationships between these components. And a citation is basically a relation between the string which refers to the work which is being cited and the string which refers to the text passage which is being cited. Um, and we extract this relation between entities. And the third step is actually looking more deeply into <coughs> this extracted relation and disambiguate, um, and disambiguate the citation. Um, so identifying the specific um, author which is being referred to and the specific scope of the citation. And to the disambiguate, we assign to each citation the CTS URN of the, text, of the text passage. So for those of you who don't know what the CTS URNs are, it's basically just a syntax uh, which is using one of the web standards, the uniform resource names, to identify uh, canonical portions of canonical text. Um, so what, what this URN says is basically 
a specific passage of the canonical idea of um, Xenophon Hellenica. Um, and the result you, you end up with is the, liter the literature review um, that you have seen before. What is actually displayed now in the interface? It's only um, really preliminary results of, of, uh, of my part of the project. And we have finished it a couple of days before actually today's presentation. So it's very much work in progress. Uh, but we are actually planning to, uh, to finish going through all the 70,000 papers uh, that are in JSO. Um, the pipeline, a little bit, if I have a bit more time. Uh, so we start from the full text. We do some text pre-processing, uh, which consists of splitting the text into sentences, uh, identify automatically the language of the text, and doing the part of speech tagging. Then we go to the citation extraction, so extracting the entities, extracting the relation between entities, and then disambiguate um, the entities. And then there is the output, which right now we have JSON for the web interface and um, some more semantic output with a mix of uh, OAC ontology and RDF. Um, but there could be other outputs possible. Uh, and the, the, the phases of the process that are marked in um, orange are those that are more challenging. Particularly, I think it's interesting, the sentence splitting, which is, uh, it's very straightforward to think about it. Well, when you do it on JSON, on a full text, which is not structured by any means, um, and if you consider text belonging to classics, where there is a high um, frequency of abbreviations that can be misunderstood as end of the sentence, then it gets very tricky. Then there is also the point of saying, why do you want to do it? And the reason I want to, to add the sentence is because I think the sentence is constituting a meaningful context for the citation, and particularly if you look at co-citations. So whenever to see this is mentioned, which other sources are mentioned, then the sentence is meaningful. But to get good results, you should correct them manually, or at least in some supervised way. But to do that on 70,000 papers, it's challenging. So I'm still trying to find um, a decent solution to that. Um, yeah. And I can talk a bit more later in case about challenges of, of the process. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was us. clearly a, a more complicated project even than you could get it uh, um, credit for here. Um, I, I wondered if, if possibly, um, maybe it's slightly unfair to say what's missing from this presentation, but maybe, maybe if I could, I could ask you to, to maybe add, add to this. Um, maybe sort of coming back to the introduction, um, could, you, could you say something a bit more in the context of, of everything we've seen here now? What um, just a little bit about what sorts of questions you can now ask of, of all this data. Now that, now that we know what this project looks like, what, how can this, what research questions can, can this tell us about now? Well, for me the most interesting question is um, to what is, um, what is described exactly in the text, uh, looking to the events. Because Honlo is not the only author, uh, I'm planning to to use as a basis for this manual um, event annotation, but maybe also others like Otel or Dean, or maybe also others, I don't know. And um, like this, we can uh, pretty much, we have a, a good um, starting point to uh, compare what we are used to know from a historical approach and what uh, the contrast can then show us if we go to the linguistic data. Uh, and like this, maybe the perspective on the text from the content can change a lot for historians as well as for archaeologists. Um, what is it about? I'm, I'm personally a classical archaeologist and like this historian, so this for me is um, the most interesting part. But in general, there are many others. I mean, uh, we provide, depending on, on what someone is looking for, 
um, several layers of uh, information. For example, if somebody is really in interested in linguistics, he can go chapter by chapter through the uh, work that Francesco did. We have all the uh, data from the tree bank there. We have, I didn't show that, so if you have internet connection, I can show it also, sure. please. If it's interesting for you, I don't know. Sure, yeah, okay. um, So this is now, yeah, it's already online, what we cool. have is there. Um, we can see the reading here like that with this, um, what I call the time map. And from this, we can easily change to the tree view. And it's sentence wise. Maybe you should uh, present it. <laughs> um, here you can see two layers of annotation the syntactical on the left and the technical grammatical. On the right. Uh, if you go on with uh, implementation, we want to then show the correlation to the written text beside and so on. So, and we will have also the data for download. So, if somebody wants really to close the treatment, this will be also there. Okay. Um, other questions like, um, what um, do we have in archaeology that Thucydides uh, mentions as a place, topography, as a building? Maybe also ancient persons, because we have. Um, Portraits of uh, persons like Themistocles or Pericles mentioned in the text and others, and um, you can you have a connection always between Gapvis and, for example, also the Arachne database. And through this, uh, what we call at the moment third place, <laughs> because it's neither Arachne nor Perseus, but a third place where both um, object databases find together that both parts of the Hellspawn project will be linked as well, so we can browse everything together in the end and do common queries. Um, through the triple store based uh, third place on the objects, on the events of the series, and also on the secondary literature of Matteo. This is for the moment maybe most yeah, yeah, yeah. important. Yeah. Just one thing. For example, uh, I forgot to mention, I wanted to study that. Uh, one historical question that you can uh, look, what, uh, just taking up what Agnes just mentioned. Um, I was struck, and I know a little bit, that uh, ancient historians really tend to imagine history as uh, uh, the work of collective actors. And I was struck by the f how much to see this uh, present the history of this Pentagon as uh, a story where the Athenians do. It's not that leader, it's not uh, though that party in Athens, but it's the Athenian as a whole that moved through the. Uh, conquering uh, the, the empire, building their own empire, with one exception. And the good uh, thing about the three bank is that you can really have some quantitative data showing you uh, how many of these actions are performed by the Athenian as a whole or by that leader. And that leader in the Pentagon of the Themistocles. It's probably the third most frequent mentioned actor. Uh, the third more the, the, the person uh, shows up as the third as the, the actor that got more actions attributed to his own initiative more than Pericles if you want to do you, have, you tend to think of the Pentagon Tidia as the time of Pericles and Pericles is of course very important in other parts of, uh, of Thucydides but uh, this Pentagon Tidia is mainly the, the history of the Athenians and uh, uh, the, what Themistocles uh, uh, built for them uh, in the building of the, the empire. And it's of course, the most, the, the most of the actions that are attributed to Themistocles are related to the construction of the wall, which in its turn uh, tells a lot about what uh, Thucydides, how Thucydides is shaping his history. So I think this kind of, uh, with, for this, nothing particularly new you may think, but you can, we can have right now some clear cut data and quantitative data that show some tendencies like that. And if we are talking about just 4,000 words, maybe it's not that much. You can read that passage in an afternoon. But obviously, we, we hope that this is also scalable up to the level of the whole work of the series and much more. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you for much. I really enjoyed this presentation and the various layers, very, very rich, very complex. Um, maybe my question is not so interesting, but I was wondering, do you have cases where you have place names that don't really, you can not really place in a map, but place names that have relationships with other places, and how, how do you deal with those? Uh, and also, related to um, Francesco's uh, part as well, 
Um, I like when you said, I can't remember now the name of the city, but when you said, I, I want to know, it's very interesting that this city is mentioned in the same sentence, so this co-occurrence, but you said, I don't have any fancy way of showing it in the map. So are you thinking of, sh do you have any ideas of how you're going to do that? Uh, do you think that the map is the way, the geographical map, or do you have other ideas of how that can be achieved? Well, uh, there are, to start with the first question, there are entities that are, um, yeah, named entities in the text. For example, it's the Athenian fleet. It's also very um, uh, important <laughs> within the text uh, that we can't really um, localize this, is it the word, yeah. Because we have, uh, of course, we have as archaeological remains, we have, maybe we could have, uh, we could imagine that there are, um, parts of the ships <laughs> themselves, which is not the case uh, for the Athenian uh, fleet in special, but okay. Um, another uh, kind of archaeological evidence is the topographies of the harbors, and then it gets difficult, because this has to do also with the organization of the fleet, and we don't know so many details, we know few. We know that Piraeus was uh, important, that many islands in the Aegean were important, but we don't know all of them, and we don't know where the harbors or each harbor maybe was uh, located, so there it gets difficult. And uh, what we do is to link, in any case, to Arachne. There we have a feature that we can handle groups like that, I mean groups of evidence that are maybe not, that do not fit in the classical archaeologi archaeological categories we have so far, like topography or object or so. Um, and for the map, at the moment, we found a solution to go with the most important place, and if the user is interested in more details, he then can follow the entry in Alachni. Okay, for the second part, well, I have to confess that I came, came up with the, the idea, uh, of, the idea uh, of linking, of way of semantically link the uh, places or the entities mentioned in the text, because when I looked at this uh, picture that we saw before of the arrows going between one point to the other, the immediate, I immediately thought we are in a context of an history that's full of military events. So I'm looking at the Risico map. I'm looking at somebody, <laughs> some army going from that from point A to point B, and it was not so. So I was, uh, I thought that this image was somehow a little bit misleading unless you know the background, of course. Then I also computational linguist that's within me told me that there is no way uh, this uh, software could know if there was some uh, semantic relevant relation uh, between those places and that's pretty much our task to do that. So my idea is that we can just keep this representation but uh, uh, so this uh, connection, these arrows are uh, similar to what we saw but maybe provide uh, user with options to uh, make different connections. I mean, so buttons or links that tell, look at the, at the locations or entities that are connected within uh, the semantic frame of journey or war. And this, obviously, the map and the arrows would change a little bit. But I'm afraid I don't have uh, such a big imagination uh, to come up with something fancier. So, of course, we are uh, open to suggestions. If there's something fancy that you want to see implemented, please. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic.